Thank you. It's a special honor for me to start this evening and give you a glimpse into my PhD project. Let's start with a thought experiment. Imagine a country with hard-working peasants, working 10, 12, even 14 hours a day. The country is mainly dependent on agriculture, and its most important and attractive export product are coffee beans. Now, since the price of coffee fell at the world market just a couple of years ago, the country has been suffering from a severe economic crisis. And additionally, a drought had led to bad agricultural returns, really limiting the food security of the country and leading to malnutrition. Now, if you were a decision maker at the International Development Association, would you help this country with development aid? Now imagine that this country has actually been colonized twice by the Germans and the Belgians, who, obsessed by race theories of the time, reinterpreted the categories Hutu and Tutsi as belonging to different races, when in fact these were just job descriptions. In the local language Kinyarwanda, Hutu means peasant and Tutsi means cattle herders. So even though they shared the same language, the same culture, the same religion, and even the same families, by the end of colonial rule, the ethnification of Rwandan society had become social reality. And after independence, Rwanda, the country of the thousand hills, did not get rid of these categories. The majority rule actually used them to discriminate against the minority, the Tutsi population by restricting its access to jobs and education, but also by tolerating and in some cases even encouraging violence against the Tutsi civilian population. Now, having this history in mind, would you still help this country with development aid? Now, imagine that helping this country actually means cooperating with an authoritarian leader. President Habyarimana, who had come to power through a military coup just a couple of decades ago, who not only was in favor of discriminating against the Tutsi population, but was in fact close friends with Hutu extremists who believed that Tutsi did not have the right to live in Rwanda at all. Now would you still help this country with development aid? Bear with me, there's one more step to go. Now imagine that this country is actually facing a civil war. A group identifying as the Rwandan Patriotic Front invaded the country and it consisted of Tutsi refugees who had fled previous violence, but also Hutu opposition politicians. They were demanding the democratization of the country, equal protection under law, the right for refugees to return to the country and national unity. They were fought back by the Rwandan armed forces under the command of the president, who was trying to cling on his, to his privileges and to his power, and in the name of self-defense, fought back with full military force. Now would you still help this country with development aid? This is exactly the situation in which the executive directors of the International Development Association found themselves in June 1991, when deciding whether or not to enter a development credit agreement with the Rwandese Republic or not. So now, imagine you are just about to lend a stranger large sums of money. You would want to know about their history, right? About their behavior, about their values, whether they have a history of not paying bills or ghosting people, or um, at least set some conditions to make sure that your money is well invested, right? It is this simple principle that did not matter as much to the International Development Association. And very soon after their discussion, they passed and entered this development credit agreement with the Rwandese Republic, allocating a whole 90 million US dollars to the Republic. Now, there were conditions, actually, but not human rights or democracy, but economic ones like liberalization, deregulation, and privatization. And although this demanded large-scale transformation of the whole Rwandan economy, and society for that matter, in their own eyes, these were just small technical adjustments that did not need more justification. But these small adjustments had a huge impact on Rwanda's society. So on one hand, 
that money that was allocated to the regime enabled the militarization of the country and increased the level of corruption. On the other hand, the conditions, the economic ones, forced the country to save money, so to cut social services that the poorest part of the population depended on, also leading to inequality in the country. Now, history is not a laboratory where we can rewind back the time, detect one factor, play it again and see whether or not an event had an actual impact on the history of a country or not. So we as historians depend on sources, archival materials to find evidence to understand whether or not an event had an impact on the history or not. And in the case of Rwanda, there's overwhelming evidence showing that the country started militarizing just weeks after they entered this program. Not only did the army grow by eight times, but thousands of paramilitary forces were founded, armed and financed, and the country imported enough weapons to arm every third adult male in the country by 1993. Remember how the country was just at the verge of bankruptcy a couple of years ago that could not have afforded this massive militarization program that we cannot account for without considering the influx of external aid. Now, do you know who actually supported this program with a bilateral contribution? It was Switzerland. Switzerland had a long, intimate relationship with Rwanda since independence, actually. It was even called the Lieblingskind the, of Switzerland. It was its country of focus for development aid. Switzerland invested in cooperatives, in nature conservation, such as the beautiful rainforest, but also in the education sector. Why? Because Switzerland had a dream. And its dream was to found a Switzerland in Africa that could serve as a role model for the whole continent. It mainly focused on the technical aspects of development aid, and in the name of neutral technical development assistance, Switzerland continued its cooperation up until the genocide. Even after the military coup in 1973 and the outbreak of civil war in 1990. Now, Switzerland was not the only development actor in the country, and it was also not the most important one. I chose this example because we are here in Basel in Switzerland today, and I thought this might be of interest to you. But various more international actors were greatly invested in the country and were physically present when the conflict unfolded. And they experienced at first hand the initial warnings. Lists being prepared of people to be killed, weapons to be distributed, plans to be made how many people can be killed in how many minutes in which districts. And even first trials, incidences of ethnically motivated violence, such as the Bugacera massacre in 1992. There are various reasons why these warnings and threats of genocide were ignored. One of them were stereotypes attached to the continent. There was this belief that a certain degree of violence and lack of democracy was usual, was typical for the sub-Saharan African continent. So that this is something that you, the price you need to pay in order to cooperate with such a country. So international actors prioritized cooperation and further continued to pursue their own interests while in the background preparations of genocide were taking place. Now, let me be very clear. It was the Hutu extremists in the interim government, in the army, in the militia, and in the civilian population who actually committed the crime of genocide. However, the extent of the crime that costed over 800,000 people's lives in a just 100 days, this unimaginable extent cannot be explained without considering the global dimensions. And now it's been 30 years since the word Hutu or Tutsi on your passport decided over life and death. It's been 30 years since massacres of civilians were televised all over the world. And it's been 30 years since the international community turned a blind eye to genocide in Rwanda. And would you also agree with me that it's now more than time to confront the past? I mean, we don't always learn from history, and that's why history can be a very, very, very frustrating subject to study. But history 
matters. If not for the sake of remembrance or justice, then at least to give ourselves the chance to learn from the mistakes that were made. Thank you.